So first of all, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today as we talk about how the industry is progressing towards digitally connected trials. So today's presentation is going to be a little bit of data and information sharing around a recent survey that we conducted on digital and decentralized trials, but it's also going to be a bit of open dialogue. Uh, we're gonna share some perspective around implications from our survey findings. I'm April Lewis, and I will be hosting today's webinar. I currently serve as the Vice President of Digital Trial Strategy here at Viva, and I'm joined today uh, by my very new colleague, but longtime industry peer, Oriel Serra. Oriel, would you like to give a, a little introduction to the audience? Thank you. That I Thanks for the invitation and the introduction. I'm Oriel Serra, Vice President Link for Clinical, a data product and application currently in development at Viva with a mission to enable connected trials with connected intelligence. I'm really looking forward to our fire chat today about a topic that certainly drives my passion and, and makes me come to work every single day. I'm excited as well. Thanks for joining me today, Oriel. So before we get started, I wanna share a little bit about why we are here today. And I think we're all acutely aware um, about the need to innovate. And I think as an industry, I, I'm certainly very proud of the efforts that we've made over the past couple of years. You know, We've focused quite heavily um, on giving patients better access and a better experience in clinical trials. Uh, we spent time really rethinking and redesigning the role of the site and, and making participation easier and simpler. And we've done a great job in thinking through ways to ensure that despite a lot of the chaos that we've been experiencing, um, that sponsors have efficiency and that we're driving efficiency for the sake of the sponsor. And so with all of this in mind, we set out really to understand how the industry is experiencing digital technology adoption as we, as we look at delivering decentralized trial operations. Today, we're gonna to share some insights with you from over 280 industry leaders They've been kind enough to share their perspective on the current digital landscape. They've shared some challenges and they've also shared some opportunities. So as I mentioned, today's webinar is gonna be in part um, some, some presentation and some findings um, with respect to the, the survey. And then it's also gonna be an open dialogue where myself and Oriol will talk about and explore some of the implications to patient insight engagement. We're going to uncover some of the changes to, to operations and operational practices as we look as an industry to deliver against the modern trial. And we're gonna discuss considerations for how as an industry, we can look at future proofing uh, based on, on the lessons that we've learned to date. Before we share results, I want to set some context and some framework for why this topic is important to Viva and how it relates to our digital strategy. From a Viva perspective, it's really important to note that our focus and the focus of our, our industry survey is really on digital trials. And we define that as how data is collected and shared through technology. And while digitization certainly can enable decentralized trial operations, which we define as being where the trial is conducted, we see digital technology as having a lot of value and a lot of applicability in all models of trial execution. So whether it's um, fully traditional, fully, fully decentralized, or anywhere in between. Our goal at Viva is really around delivering connected trials, irrespective of the operating model. Our strategy is really anchored on creating this fully connected ecosystem. It's one where we're developing fit for purpose, high value digital experiences for sponsors, for sites, and for patients. And we're doing that while connecting data and creating interoperability and information exchange on the back end within a single platform. Our strategy is aimed at delivering three main goals. The first is removing as much paper as possible from the process. And, and it's really focused on automating transactional activities and opening up that space for collaboration and innovation and relationship management. The second is around driving patient centricity. And when we say patient centricity, we don't only mean it with respect to the applications we're building for patients to use, but we mean it in the reduction of the burden and the noise uh, to enable sponsors and sites to have more time to focus on patient care and patient outcomes. And lastly, as I mentioned, it's really around supporting decentralized trial operations and doing so by enabling the kind of 
interoperability and interconnectivity across stakeholders to deliver the speed and the cost gains that we need to do this efficiently. At the core of what we're delivering is interoperability. And when we talk about interoperability, we don't only mean it from a systems lens. Our focus on interoperability is, connect, is, is rooted in connecting people and connecting process and connecting data together in one platform. What this means is that we're focusing on connectivity and interoperability in verticals across stakeholders. So if you think about something like consent, okay, think about the process of drafting consent, iterating on it, approving it, storing it, distributing it, and then reporting back out on it from patient to site to sponsor. And then we're also looking at interoperability horizontally across processes and people and stakeholders. Things like patient data collection, not only the process of collecting it, but the oversight of it, the risk management, the cleaning, and the archiving. It's about like interoperability across this entire trial journey, but doing it from multiple dimensions. And hopefully that gives you a good sense of, of why this topic is so important to us here at Viva. So our, our survey method, we distributed a survey globally to clinical operations leaders earlier this year, first half. The survey consisted of nine questions where we were looking at understanding how the industry is rapidly adopting decentralized trial operations. We invited 15,000 participants, 2,100 or so were initiated, and about 289 respondents uh, we, va we validated, embedded, and, and made sure that they were qualified and uh, they became our respondents for the purposes of this survey. We made sure we had a mix of zeros and sponsors. We engaged with multiple regions, so North, certainly North America, Europe, the UK, and some rest of world. And we did compensate, uh, nominal compensation for, for those who completed the survey. From an executive summary perspective, I wanna share three main themes that came out of our survey. Uh, the first is we've got this unprecedented willingness to adopt and explore new technology. And I think that that's, that's great news. We haven't seen this sort of volume of exploration and, and innovation before. We're also seeing that folks are think, rethinking the way that they're, they're working. They're rethinking their processes. They're rethinking their systems. They're rethinking how they engage with sites and patients. Um, but we're seeing some, some breaks in interoperability and we're seeing folks think about how to find the appropriate balance between modifying or changing or modernizing ways of working with the interoperability that's required to be successful. And as such, we're seeing sponsors and, and actually mostly CROs, and you'll, you'll see uh, some of this data come through in just a moment, really recognizing the need around these scaled approaches to rationalize systems, to rationalize processes, and to think through um, the efforts that we've made in the, in the pandemic for a more holistic approach. We had some key findings here that you're gonna see sort of as a theme throughout everything that we're talking about today. Um, bottom line, decentralized trials are, are here to stay. We've had significant growth over the past two years. Two years ago, respondents reported that they were 28% uh, of them we're conducting decentralized trial methods. It's 87% now, and we're seeing a forecast of 95% moving forward into the next two years. But we're also seeing that we haven't realized the gains yet, which quite frankly is probably to be expected. Just over a half of respondents are seeing positive impact on patient experience. We're also seeing that we have this common theme that we've had for many years and the number one challenge continues to remain the adoption of technology by sites. So bottom line is we've had this, this unprecedented change in many ways for the better, but we've got a lot of work to do to operationalize and operationalize well in this new model. Well, I just stated that 95% uh, of respondents plan to conduct decentralized trial operations moving forward. I, I personally always get very skeptical in how we go about executing when these large initiatives come up. But I think this is different. 
And I think it's different because what we're seeing are these ground up movements. We're seeing boots on the ground, operational folks pledging to continue the progress that we've made over the last 24 months. The hashtag no going back. Um, and it's not just boots on the ground folks, it's executives as well. So we're seeing it from all ends and it's, it's really very powerful stuff. You know, I've been in this industry my entire career at oil, I know you have as well. And you know, while I had personal challenges the last two years being locked in a house with three teenage daughters, um, professionally, this is the most exciting it's ever been. I never would have imagined our industry would pivot the way it has um, and, and pivot so quickly. I know that in the past, we've had a lot of focus on, on patient-focused groups, but really that was about building advocacy. That was about um, small patient panels but we're seeing this whole new genre. We're seeing the, the patient-focused drug development guidance come out. We're seeing the birth of the, the chief patient officer role and a lot of investment and energy put towards delivering a more consumer-like experience, a more humanistic experience for trial access and participation. That said, we've moved quite quickly and we've done so as we had to in a very reactive framework. So I think our response has really been around maintaining business continuity, around maintaining patient care. And now, as you would expect, we're starting to see some challenges as we progress forward. And I'm really excited to spend some time with the audience today and with you, Oriel, talking through those. We're seeing challenges in patient and site experience. We're seeing uh, challenges in data and interoperability. And then we're seeing a lot of opportunity about technology and the role technology can play in, in overcoming some of these challenges. So Oriel, for, for the audience's sake, um, your most recent role was at Pfizer and you were responsible for, um, for site intelligence, site engagement. And you were in the middle of this chaos, like smack in the middle of it in some of the fastest innovation I think our industry has ever seen. Your responsibilities included shifting on a dime to reconsider how you place studies, where you place studies, and what the role of the site was. And I know I'm excited um, to hear what that looked like from the inside out, but I, I would love if you could share a little bit with the audience as well around, around what that experience really was like from the inside. The things that, really, uh, I mean, the story I'm going to tell is one that for once in a lifetime, hopefully, <laughs> we all share in different shape or form, but span off the same challenge. Our working environment and personal life as we knew it was challenged almost overnight, right? At the time of the pandemic of set, I was working at Pfizer, as you all mentioned, as the head of site intelligence, leading a team responsible to drive confidence and selection efforts with intelligence for the whole Pfizer portfolio. As data nerds, uh, we had been following the exponential growth of COVID-19 cases around the globe, and we were really anticipating a change in our operating and data models, right? Uh, we're thinking of potential impacts. We were already you know, uh, thinking about how we can deal with this. Um, but honestly, those impacts came much faster than any of us ever expected. We had to quickly pivot to advance aspirational and futuristic ideas much faster than we ever thought. Um, in a percent speed, of course, it, while at the same time managing our personal family and family and friends' emotional well-being, right? So quite a, quite a challenging situation. To advance those ideas, we had to reorganize the way we work and thought, right? So uh, for example, up until then, we were using an agile methodology for product and data models development, but we actually had to upscale it to everything we were doing, right? Um, every day we had stand-ups, you know, and, and we had to reprioritize constantly to respond to, you know, the rapidly evolving and quickly shifting priorities, right? Um, we had to quickly form new alliances, for example, right? Uh, we were having some light partnerships in the past with the Epidemiology Center of Excellence, but we had to form daily meetings with them to anticipate those attack rates. We had to work with academic institutions externally to validate those external rates, right? So in essence, each of us was upscaling in a, in a new skill in no time, right? And locking arms, you know, and incorporating new elements into our business that probably would have required a lot of alignment and definitely a lot of piloting before, uh, you know, adoption, right? Uh, new algorithms, new products that I believe trans essentially transform our business model in a way that there is no alternative for going back. In short, I believe that, that we did redefine the innovation process, right? Um, you know, with great success, I must admit, you know, we did deliver on the outcomes required for that job. But I think the question is something we're gonna touch upon today, right? Is, is this something that we would continue upscaling considering the, the amount of resource demands it took and, and the industry risk tolerance levels? 
Yeah, it's a great point. I, I love your use of the term agile operations. You know, being a product person, it took us a while to get to the place where we were comfortable with agile product development. To do agile operations overnight is is just it's it's mind blowing. Um, and I think you know you've got a head start. I think against many in the industry right now, just given that experience. But your comments around risk tolerance are ones that that, that really resonate very well with me. I'm I'm curious to see what happens. We've redefined our tolerance level. But I think that's an important point that we need to stay mindful of as, as we move forward and talk through some of these challenges today. So let's go through some implications here. And I want to talk about site experience. So, you know, of course, as an industry, we all know we've, we've continued to struggle to drive technology adoption with sites. Um, and we've, we've made a lot of effort. We've tried to streamline and create consistency in the way sponsors engage sites in technology, but I think it's it's oftentimes been futile. And in my experience, this is really a direct re result of us building tech for sponsors and for sponsor needs. The tech really should be removing transactional headaches. It should be creating these frictionless ways of working together. And it should be supporting our ability to collaborate and innovate and partner and, and build relationships. But the data that we have coming from the survey, that's not what we're seeing. I've spent a lot of time with sites in my career talking about how to make technology work between sponsor and site. And what's interesting is I've repeatedly been told by sites that they're not totally objected to using multiple systems. What they really care about is whether or not those systems that are put in front of them add value, not only to them and their business operations, but to their patients. So I think about every organization that I've worked for, there's always been some key initiative around single sign-on. Got to have single sign-on to give access, easy access to sites, to technology. But if you're giving single sign-on to a bunch of low-value solutions, what does that actually, what does it accomplish? What does it actually mean? Um, so what we're seeing here in the results is not only the challenge and, and a number one priority to, to work against that challenge, but we're seeing some, some what I would consider poor results in that only 29% of respondents are seeing an improvement in, in site engagement. Um, through these efforts. And, and I, I think that's, in my opinion, a direct reflection of value. So I want to talk through some implications to site selection, um, starting with site selection. A quarter of sites have actually not taken the necessary steps to prepare for decentralized trial adoption and implementation. And that's, that's a stat that came directly from SCRS. I call this a little bit of chicken and egg at the moment, right? Because we're requiring sites or thinking about selecting sites that have experience. But how can they get experience if we won't select them because they don't have experience? And I think about my daughter who's a freshman in college and quite frankly, COVID did her a, a, a solid. She wasn't required to turn in her SAT scores as part of her college application process. And the you know, the educational system recognized we completely changed the learning model over the past year and a half, right? I mean, kids learning virtually is it's a whole other thing, right, for a whole other webinar. But basically, they changed their evaluation criteria. They changed their selection criteria, and they recognized there were other factors that needed to come in, into play to really evaluate the potential of a, of a student and their fit to uh, an institution. So with that in mind, in the context of sites, how does, our, how does our thinking around evaluating performance of sites need to shift? We've changed the model, we've changed the goalpost. Are there contingencies that we can make so that we can ensure that when we're, we're evaluating and selecting sites, we're being considerate of the pivot? Those are great points and insights, April. You know, and I think everybody is wondering about that, right? I mean, in my personal opinion, there's no doubt that the global research landscape is, is an inflection point, right? I believe, in fact, it was before COVID, with non-top sites being often saturated, right? Mergers and acquisitions, uh, emerging new and larger site networks, and the demands on the industry, sponsored trials and site technology applications readiness growing exponentially. And on top of that, with many players and often fragmented a suite of applications being deployed in the clinical trial landscape. If we think about that a third of the sites, right, um, engage in research in a given year are new to sponsors and that mostly half of them are naive to research. And that is helping out of a real need, right, to diversify and expand the site to search footprint given the exponential increase in the number of clinical trials. Now on top of that, 
we are changing the operational model and require additional elements and new experience from sites to operate in this new environment. And not just that, at the same time, we're shortening the runway for them to get set up, activated, and enroll the required number of patients, right? I mean, it is a lot, right? So how do we come these ever-expanded barriers of entry? I think in my opinion, it's by equipping those functions responsible for planning on these clinical trials with connected intelligence and connected applications, right? And that's so they can map the needs of, uh, and the, of the clinical trials and the opportunities ahead and do the right site onboarding, build the right training plans, you know, and then facilitate site navigation through this process so they can successfully execute towards, you know, the needs of the clinical trial. I believe that is simple, yet very powerful, and it would definitely increase the chance for them to repeat business. Yeah, you know, I, I have to agree. I think we have the means to access data in a way that we haven't before, and it gives us a nice opportunity to really redefine what successful entry criteria looks like. Um, things like, and I know we've talked about this before, things like a network that surrounds a site or a PI can give you sort of an indicator of their connection to the community. Um, tracking early adopter status, not only of, of new medications, but early adopter status of technologies. If we really do this right, we can start enabling some visibility around performance against those new KPIs so that we can make better decisions moving forward. There's a lot of opportunity here to rethink this one. Uh, the second piece that I want to talk through in terms of implications in the site space is this, this growing desire to build optionality for the patient, right? And these optionality-based study designs, which is great for the patient, tons of convenience for the patient, but it's leading to this kind of mishmash in a way of working for sites. So much so that I, I'm reading now that digital research navigators are starting to pop up at, at large institutions, and their role is specifically to help sites and patients understand new technology. To me, that's a bit of a red flag. Um, you know, it's a learning curve, of course, for sites, not only on, on these new technologies we're putting in front of them, how to support the technologies, but then how to engage with patients while ensuring that, that you know, the privacy laws and everything are, are, are being um, adhered to. So how do, we, how do we help sites? How do we support sites in this, this new model so that they can continue to have faith and feel, feel comfortable and safe in their clinical oversight and ensure that they're, they've got patient continuity of care? Great questions again. You know, so I, I believe the shape and form of organizations as we know it are, are changing, right? Both at the sponsor side, at the zero side and at the site side, right? And, and this is inevitably changing to respond to the current demands that as you all mentioned before, mostly spawn off from a grassroots movement, right? I believe this presents a challenge, but at the same time, an opportunity to embark this journey together. We're all in it. We're facing the same challenge. Let's go, you know, let's lock arms and, and try to solve this, right? Uh, true, there is a learning curve, you know, for sites and at the same, same time sponsored CROs on how to support sites with refined roles and that can speak about both technology and operations, right? For example, in the impacts and how jobs are performed and anticipate bottlenecks roadblocks that you know, may, may trump the adoption and the implementation of new technology, right? I believe right, that this being a barrier for the entry of new sites with the right coaching and boarding support, we can turn this into an opportunity for new entrants, right? A simple analogy, this is simple. Technology enabled many drivers to provide writing services that before were reserved for laborious and costly entry processes, right? On the patient side, we must think about a bit differently, right? Um, while one of today's main priorities is to expand access to research to under, underrepresent them, demographics, right, across the globe, and technology should definitely be an enabler, you know, for this to happen. If we don't think about this technology and the diverse circumstances and how to apply this technology, we may be building a taller fence and only increase the gap for them to access clinical research, right? So. We must acknowledge the diversity and build flexibility for the many realities, many realities to coexist. In my opinion, this is not a one-way highway. Yeah, no, I, I think that I agree. It's not a one-way highway, but I also think we need to think about implementing technology that's, that's multifaceted to be successful. You know, technology that can remove the administrative and the tactical burden like we've talked about, but also provides visibility for stakeholders into the status of the study, the patient status, and at a third dimension is giving sort of the, the training and the education and the support that's required to make technology successful. 
Uh, and yeah, and technology plays definitely a major role, right? So we need to stop building products out of a base list of requirements and think about the jobs and outcomes that it should serve to optimize the user experience, while at the same time optimizing the speed and quality and how those outcomes are achieved, right? I think it's simple. We need to simplify the user experience by enabling those jobs with simple UIs, user interfaces, sorry, you know, that do not require 100 page instructions, right? For example, a simple feature like drag and drop, right, in a technology, in an application, it minimizes the number of clicks and it allows people to complete tasks much faster. Great point. The third piece that I think I would like to, to hone in on is um, the one and done. <laughs> Over 50% of sites, they do one trial and they don't do another. And I think what we're creating right now is this perfect storm. We're adding technologies, we're increasing burden. We've got the, you called it agile operations, but this, this operational impact of, of the hybrid trial, the choose your own adventure that we're, we're offering to patients. And I think your commentary around creating more barriers to entry is, is spot on. But you know, how do we overcome that? I, I'm fearful that we're gonna end up heading down this path of the great PI resignation. Right. I mean, I mean, you know, the cost of entering this business is high, right? And then without repeat business and guaranteed repeat business and the right investment to coach and grow these new entrants that, as we know, it are much needed, right? The chance of failure is too high. You know, I believe the mindset has to change in multiple roles. Sites with strong KPIs have not developed overnight, right? We have to invest in developing new sites. And we need to do it showcasing the ROI of investing to develop new sites is much higher than you know the cost of study delays, site non-performance, right? Overinflated content set for prints because normally we built in the error in on the planning on the side of clinical trials, right? So I think we need to think our business model is opportunity based and relies less on evidence, defining my opinion and somehow outdated KPIs. And I in the role of technology here is very, very important, right? We need to build connected applications that leverage connected intelligence, you know, that go beyond the traditional KPIs uh, that, you know, allow for this proactive risk management approach and deploy corrective actions, you know, coaching actions before the failure becomes unattainable, right? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think, you know, we need technology that enables visibility across not only stakeholders and processes, but captures data in that standardized way and enables a, a kind of clean view of risk. I mean, from a, a Viva perspective, our goal is to overcome some of these challenges. And we're doing that in this space, in the site space, specifically by digitizing a lot of those transactional, um, transactional activities so that sites can focus on patient care. They can, uh, we can provide sites with technology that's, that's fit for purpose and build it as we were talking about for them while connecting all of that data on the back end to enable sponsors to, to have the kind of trial oversight to see the risks, the bottlenecks, the indicators um, where sites may be struggling or need additional education and support. I wanna shift a little bit and I wanna talk about uh, patient experience. So when it comes down to it, everything we're doing right now is, is for the sake of patient. It's in the name of, of today's clinical trial patient. It's, it's in the name of tomorrow's treated patient. And as we, we're pushing and pushing to provide these consumer-like experiences that are based off of convenience, we have to be really mindful that we've got various personas with various preferences across a bunch of different patient cohorts. And we're seeing in our survey results, we're seeing the challenges reflected in the areas of, of technology adoption at patients in compliance. And we're seeing a strong effort being placed um, by sponsors and CROs and in, in providing that sort of education and support for patients to overcome those barriers. But what I find interesting is that right now, our survey results are showing that 56% of respondents see positive benefits of convenience and retention for patients. And that's within this new decentralized trial model. My question when I see something like this is, is that good? Is it bad? Is it great? It's been 18, 24 months. Is this phenomenal? Is this what's to be expected? You know, how do we interpret that? Well, you know, I, to me, this is uh, this metric is actually good, right? So it's a positive signal and we should treat us that. And what it means is that there's a lot of work that remains to be done so we can increase confidence and adoption levels, right? So as discussed before, we need to think 
about this as a multifaceted opportunity where several priorities, several business priorities must coexist in harmony, right? For example, if we focus too hard on technology, right? But at the same time, we don't acknowledge it's very, not just for cell browser, for our patients, we will fail to advance all missions at once, right? For example, we talked about, you know, let's not trump the experience of equitable access to care, you know, by certain underrepresented minorities, you know, by pushing too hard these CTs without acknowledging that certain demographics need different type of, you know, coaching and adoption efforts, right? Uh, we cannot leave anybody behind, you know, we have to move together forward, you know, and, and that takes a lot of thinking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it does. Um, no patient left behind. I, I think, you know, the concept that, that I think we need to recognize that it doesn't mean that we can't digitize and support the site and the sponsor needs. For example, even in those instances where patients, you know, want and, and continue to want face-to-face, -face, I think we can still enable sort of digital data collection between patient and PI, which still enables in parallel that real-time and structured data flow. Um, for trial oversight for the sponsor. So I think we can we can find technology is a great opportunity to embed at different points in the journey to, to find that balance and really not alienate, um, you know, irrespective of the of the operating model. So I'd love to spend a little time talking through some of the implications of the data that we saw uh, in the patient experience from the survey. One key area that we've already started talking about, and I want to dig into a little bit more, is around access not only access to technology, but access to trial opportunities. Um, in this decentralized trial model, we're using a number of patient-facing applications. We've got eConsum, ePro, we've got virtual visits, patient concierge services, and, and it adds some complexity. I think the modern patient can certainly work through that quite well. Um, but what about the patients without, you know, without internet, without computer, without the right version to an iPhone, for example, we're in this position where we're, we're trying to serve many patient masters and they have different needs and different expectations of care. And curious your perspective, you know, if we do this effectively, how do we use technology to deliver against, you know, what I would call the 80-20 rule? Right, I mean, technology should definitely be a key enabler, enabler to empower this mission, right? But, but for that to be true, as we mentioned, we can make things more complicated, rather we need to simplify them, right? We need to develop technologies that take into consideration, as we all mentioned before, the user experience, not just for the, you know, <laughs> ideal set of customers, but for all of them, right? For all the end users and plan for different levels of adoption and support so we can reach a mature state, you know, in an equitable way. We need to be cognizant so we don't dehumanize the whole process. Human empathy, I always believe, right, that human empathy and intuition goes a long way and should always be at the core of any innovation or process optimization we do in clinical trials. Yeah, I, I agree. I think this, the simplification um, and user experience designs that suit the needs of different patients has got to be key. I would add on to that that I do see technology as a wonderful enabler to access and we can't make it a, a barrier to entry we can't start treating technology as an inclusion exclusion criteria. And, and that's my fear. Just as we have built plans for optionality for patients in their trial journeys, we need an optionality for technology journeys for patients. Um, and to do that successfully, we really need flexibility in the way we capture data along that journey without sacrificing speed and quality. And I think this is, this is where it gets tricky, right? That's the tall order. Uh, another challenge that I want to talk about is, is the patient experience itself and who actually owns that experience. We're moving away from a purely trial-based experience to one of more of a, a consumer-based experience. And our needs to deliver against consumer demand, which is new. I think in many cases, right, given the state of maturity that we're at, technology, services, service providers are, are a bit falling short. The, the site is responsible, when the site is responsible for the technology, for example, and the site isn't the best at technology themselves or doesn't like technology, the patient's ending up getting the short end of the stick. The way we're building technology today, in a lot of ways, has been without the customer relationship. If you're going to do something in this space, the technology vendor needs to treat the patient as a customer. We need a one-on-one -on -one between the tech and the patient, the tech and the site, the tech and the sponsor. But even in that model, I have to question who's responsible for the patient experience. Is it the tech company? 
Is it the sponsor that's pushing the tech on the site? Is it the site as they manage that patient relationship? Um, I think patients, of course, you know, they, they associate the entirety of the study to the site, not only how they feel, but how they log in. So who, who's accountable? Who's responsible here? Good question. I think all of us, right? So none of us should be reluctant to talk to patients at any time. And I believe sometimes the lack of action is just influenced by risk aversion and or lack of clarity on how we can talk to them during current data privacy laws. That don't get me wrong, they're there for very good reasons. I believe maybe the challenge spans off from the fact that while discussions are happening in different life cycles of drug development, these are fragmented. You know, I hear at times about the patient precise centric model. And beyond that, you know, the in-source, there's outsource model. I think we need to talk, we need to find a way to talk about the human-centric model, right? We're all in the same boat. In fact, many apps in the industry serve many hats, including the patient one, right? So there are ways we can bring this discussion together. And in fact, it does happen at times. So about putting the effort to normalize it, in my opinion. Yeah, you raise a really good point. I don't think we often think of it that way. I mean, even a site can be a patient. A sponsor can be a patient, and we're not leveraging those experiences that are more universal to really tackle this problem from, from multiple dimensions. I want to I wanna talk a little bit about adherence as well. Um, and so, again, you know, referring to some, some reading and some data that I've, I've seen over the past couple of years that patients who were on studies when COVID hit were thrown technology, they were able to manage it. They were committed to the study. They had a, a level of engagement that I'm assuming was won by the relationship. Um, they were convinced by the doctor or the nurse to join and, and there was a level of commitment there. I've also seen data on the flip side with fully remote studies where there's a, a, an increase in dropout rates. There's really, in, in my opinion, and putting my patient hat on, right? There's no, there's no substitute for the relationship between a patient and a physician. And in many ways, as you mentioned before, we're really dehumanizing trials in this new decentralized model. You know, a nurse is going to come to your house, but it's a different nurse than it was last week. Or um, you're gonna see a physician, but you're only gonna meet them over telehealth. There's, there's something that might be missing in our opportunity for trust building. You know, how do you use technology to, to, to build that relationship that, that helps drive adherence? Where's the challenge in that? I think this is the $1 million question, right? I mean, especially today, right? Um, we are come, we're still in the pandemic, you know, and clearly, you know, the, the trials, you know, for COVID-19 vaccines, you know, and, you know, and, you know, prophylaxis and all of that, you know, there are success stories in this stage, you know, but, but in my opinion, these were because one, we're all focused on addressing the very same challenge, you know, and we still are, in my, as a matter of fact, and then because of the incredible investment in hyper care during the pandemic, right? There are lessons to be learned, though, you know, that may allow us to upscale this in a way that we can work smarter and not necessarily harder. I really don't think that the model can be replicated exactly the same way, given the amount of resources, skill upscale and investment required in a very fast pace. But, you know, look, we reacted to, to a need and built a model overnight that worked and, and we'll, we're learning a lot of it, you know? So it's about messaging, communicating, it's about building flexibility, it's about focus and tasks, you know, focus on time, autonomy with alignment, and then are removing unnecessary bureaucracy, right? I mean, when I was at Pfizer, we removed a lot of, you know, handovers, you know, and simplify the way we change information that enabled, you know, to, to move at the speed, you know, that, that it required, you know, to develop these vaccines and these, you know, prophylactic treatments, you know, so... Hey, you know, can technology be used to personalize the experience and not dehumanize it? Yes, of course it can. It's done wonders in many, you know, other industries. And, you know, it's done wonders with families and friends who can connect at any time, all the time. We should be able to do the same in research, right? We should be able to offer a more connected experience through technology. Yeah, I love that analogy about connectivity with friends and, and family. I mean, I experience that myself. I'm closer with some people that I don't see on a regular basis. Now I see them, uh, albeit virtually. But you know, if we build, to your point, if we build the kind of te technology that automates sort of the more tactical, task-driven, administrative components, reduces the number of handovers, et cetera, we should be able to get to a place where things like virtual visits become more about relationship building. There's more room for technology to be used to connect 
and support the relationship. I think that's something interesting we should continue to watch. Okay, so we're gonna spend a little time talking also about data and interoperability. And this is our last section before we'll, we'll get to some Q&A. So what we're seeing uh, is that CROs are, are leading the pack and that's perhaps not surprising, but they're leading the pack in terms of adoption of new decentralized technology. On average, they're adopting four new patient and site facing solutions. They're adopting at almost twice the pace of sponsors. On the flip side, you're seeing sponsors pulling back a little bit and you're starting to see them look to rationalize, looking sort of cautiously and examining connectivity and interoperability and taking their time thinking about uh, really how to make this work for the long term. I think for the CRO, you know, they have to deliver, it's full steam ahead. But despite a lot of the progress we've made, we're still seeing a lot of fragmented technology. And we're seeing that play out in the data from the survey in terms of challenges with site adoption and patient burden, and more importantly, data collection and reporting. And there's some risk there in whether or not we end up diminishing some of the gains that we've, we've you know, achieved in terms of study speed and quality and collaboration. At the end of the day, there's, there's a number of implications. We've done a lot of pilots, a lot of trial and error, but we're seeing almost half of respondents challenged with operationalizing. So let's talk a bit about interoperability. Um, as we look at this solution landscape and, and the adoption, the results and, and the commentary from the survey bubble up three things. One is around scale. Right. We've gone from point solution to platform on our core operating systems, and we took a while, lots of effort. And now we're coming back to add in more point solutions. We're in this weird space, and we're, we're trying to rationalize, but we're experimenting. We want to integrate, but we aren't sure of the use case. Um, we've got all of this lightning speed innovation. We've adopted fast. We've got multiple data streams. We've got multiple ways of working, but we don't have a whole lot of proof points. And so I think there's something to be said here about thinking through how you get to steady state and not only how you get there, but what does steady state actually look like? And then on top of that, you've got data, right? And our data, uh, our industry struggles and always has with data processing and ingestion. Uh, as I mentioned, four plus new patient and site facing technologies being adopted. Do we actually have foundation to process that? We're implementing these new innovative solutions. We're capturing data in real time our assumption is we're gonna be able to process that data in real time, but, but is that realistic? And then lastly, I, you know, I wanna talk a little bit about visibility and, and these all come together actually. Um, I've spent a lot of my career looking at how you optimize visibility across a portfolio. I was at GSK when, when everything hit and um, had responsibility for, for helping to figure out how we could see what was happening across our portfolio. We had four data sources we were looking at. Two were from established, um, established systems that we had in-house, our, our CTMS and an enrollment forecasting solution we used. And then we added two new ones. One was Johns Hopkins data to help us understand you know, the game of whack-a-mole about where COVID was gonna hit next. Uh, and the other one was some local country feedback. You know, is, the, is the country on lockdown? Are patients willing to go to sites? Those kinds of things. And the effort was just enormous. <laughs> enormous, and that's two established data sources and two new, new data sources. And I think these three focus areas, they all tie together, they're all interdependent. Right? You can't have scale without having visibility. You can't have visibility without having strong and connected data foundation. So I know you've had some ex similar experience that I had in terms of creating and maintaining visibility in, in this very dynamic trial, the most dynamic trial environment in history. Um, with a lot of new technology, a lot of new data assets, what, what really is the key here to getting to a scaled steady state? I think we can have another webinar on this one, but let, let's start with data, right? So, and I do agree this is a foundational element. You know, if we look at industry trends, and if we look about the last decade, right, you know, the mean number of endpoints grew almost by 30%, you know, and now we collect over 3 million data points now given phase three clinical trial, right? As reported by Tufts, you know? So what this means is that an industry, especially drug developers, we need to respond with evolving clinical data demand with new strategies and tactics. For example, you know, this is simple. We need to establish a formal data strategy and governance models to manage this data flow, compliance and accessibility, establish data tools and techniques to organize this clinical data into hubs, repositories, 
that are you know there to expand the role of data scientists that make sense of this data. So each point collected truly serves an outcome, right? So this collecting, in case we need it in the future, you know, I think we need to reconsider this approach, right? We need to collect what we're going to be using to do the job we need to be doing. Yeah, and I think you know this is where interoperability with core technology as it relates to digital trials is the key. We can't overcomplicate it. We can't complicate it further. We need the back of the house to be you know, in good order. We need that data to be in good order. And if our governance is, is strong, then it becomes about extension and expansion, not necessarily uh, you know, new governance or, or new ways of working. It's, it's uh, I think, the way that we're going to get to supporting some of these new data streams. You know, it's a simple analogy, right? This is to me like building a house, right? So you need to plan and design this house, you know, thinking how big you wanted it to be, even if you don't have the budget or even if you don't know where the kitchen is going to go, you know, but you cannot build a tiny house and then start spending to build a skyscraper, right? It's going to crumble, you know? So this is the same. That's why you need those data governance, you know, and data strategies models, you know, to define the rest of it, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, I think um, you made a comment earlier about portfolio level commitment. And uh, I, I think that's really interesting from a scale perspective. You, know, you see numerous study teams with uh, perspective around, you know, not my trial, my trial is too complicated. And I think if we're really gonna deliver on this mission of digital and decentralized trials, we have to take the portfolio approach. There's no choice. As I said in the beginning of this, it's really about how we execute against this vision. And I'm fearful that the sort of pick and choose is going to compromise scale and value. I agree. You know, I mean, my opinion to normalize the behavior and approach and a process, we need to spell it out at first with bold and capital letters, right? I mean, history was proven over, over and over again that when we create value, late adopters follow, right? <laughs> so it's about how we, how fast we get them to, to follow, right? And it will compromise visibility, right? So if we don't do it all at once, right? So in my opinion, this is about establishing that the data strategy and governance model we talked about, you know, and having the right people doing their jobs to ensure this data is connected and serves a clear purpose, as I mentioned before, right? In my previous life, it started all by enabling the right degree of data stewardship and domain expertise accountability to build a common and unique registry other business functions could choose from, right? Rather than creating their own repositories, registries, um, that ultimately were fragmenting data or even creating ghost data sources, right? Each function brings something to the table, you know, clearly, you know, we all know our experts have everything, you know? So it's a matter of defining what it is and how it's adding value to the sum, right? So. Yes, it took many meetings, you know, uh, pitches, long hours of influencing, but we keep our message 100% focused on value creation for all and taking into consideration all stakeholders, right? You know, this governance, you know, is, criti is a critical foundational step in my opinion, no? And it needs to be stepwise, starting with the core operational data. You said it, you know, we have moved platforms for the very reason of that interoperability. It's a must. And I think I'm blending new data assets that requires extension of governance. It's not, shouldn't be a new effort, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I agree. You know, and I think you're right. It is stepwise. And, and our goal here is really at Viva the, to bring it to a whole new level. Our vision is, is really that about expanding the foundational elements that already exist in our core operating systems and that data connectivity. It's, it's our opinion that it's much easier to move to the front end of the house with sites and patients if you have your, your back end in order. Um, and that's how we get to scale, right? And that's how we get to, to connectivity and interoperability in this ecosystem. I wanna talk a bit about the role of, of technology um, as we wrap this up. You know, it's, it's rapid fire adoption. And like I said earlier, it's, it's great to see us innovating quickly, but our industry is recognizing a lot of challenges with efficiency and cost and quality. And our position here is that there's, there's five key opportunities for how technology can support the modern trial. Um, but in order to be value add, let's be clear, all five of these really should be in place and they need to be equally in place across st stakeholders. And these include things like access. Does the tech improve the ease of access in which I can participate or find one another or find trials? Does it make my life better, my work better, my ability to collaborate better by adding value? 
Is it all connected? Is it going to give me that seamless experience? Is it fast? And I don't mean that just from a data collection perspective, but as we talked about, a data processing perspective. And can it handle more than one trial? Looking ahead, you know, we've committed to delivering this fully connected end-to-end -end digital platform. And as we at Viva commit, we're, we're going to commit to anchor on connectivity at the core of everything that we do. The connectivity of stakeholders, of data, of workflow. We're going to commit to treating the patient, the site, and the sponsor equally as, as customers. We're going to commit to digitizing all the things that should be digitized as best we can. And we're going to do so while providing single access points, again, driving that seamless experience. And ultimately, we're committing to delivering this on a common technology for all stakeholders across the entire research ecosystem. So as you can see, the topic of digital and decentralized trials is, is obviously a, a passion for Viva. It's a passion for me, and I know it's a passion for you, Oriel. And I've, I've really enjoyed our discussion today. Um, and audience, I hope you did as well. We've left a little bit of time for Q&A here at the end. So we're going to spend a few minutes now going through some of the audience questions. Um, just as a reference point, I'm going to be posting at the end of this a, uh, a link to the survey where, of course, you can see all the data that supported the conversation that we had today as well. And if we don't get to your question, we will be following up. Okay, let's see. All right. First question here. Uh, you mentioned fragmented systems and solutions as a main challenge, but isn't that par for the course when any industry is at this level of, of innovation? Is that something that really can be overcome? It's an interesting question. I mean, yes, it is to be expected given the level of, of innovation that we're at, but I think it can also be minimized. So I think as we've talked about, our industry has made these massive efforts over the past 10 years to move from these highly customized point solutions to platform um, on our backend systems, our CTMS, our TMF, et cetera. It was expensive, it was labor intensive. Um, and the amount of untangling that we had to do with all the custom APIs and integrations was a nightmare. And I know because I had to do it. Um, and I think my intent in focusing on fragmented solutions in this pre presentation is really around moving from reactive mode where we've been implementing for the sake of needing a solution to thinking more holistically around how it all fits together and how these new solutions sit on top of the foundation. Um, like I said, from our perspective, it's much, much easier to build from the back end to the front than the other way around. And that's our approach to ensuring operability and interoperability. True, true. I mean, and, and, and as we mentioned, you know, over the last, that last decade, especially the last two years, right? We've learned valuable lessons to build scalable and connected products from the start with the foundation that allows that level of interoperability, you know, that today's clinical trials require. When we talk about data strategies before, right, and data governance models, and then each for each domain area to bring a common registry, you know, to those, you know, to a common registry, those key data assets properly labeled, and with those features that they, you know, bring to data assets, you know, properly engineered, we are indeed preventing that fragmentation we talked before and eliminating from the equation those goals registries, therefore, you know, enabling the connection of those applications, right, through a core set of data elements, you know. Yeah, it's not a small undertaking by any means. Uh, okay, thanks, Oriel. It's another question here. Um, what do you think is the most impactful patient-facing technology on the market to date? Oh my gosh, um, that's tough. I'm gonna answer that in two ways. I'm gonna answer that with my patient hat on, um, not necessarily related to, to clinical trials, but I think as a patient, the patient portal for me has been the most valuable um, technology that's that's been put out. So to be able to schedule an appointment without having to make calls and then get them on their lunch break or um, I think to get my test results, because whenever they call me, inevitably, I'm, I'm not there to pick up the phone, but so to be able to log in and, and see test results has been, um, has been great. I think from a, a trial perspective, it's a great question to ask patients. And I, I don't personally have a data point on that, um, but now I'm going to look one up. But I think uh, 
you know, if, if I have to, to give a quick answer to that, I think it would be probably sensors. There's something to be said, I think, for that, that ease of data capture, that ease of data collection, um, that a sensor can, can really drive a significant impact. Um, Oriel, I don't, you know, what's your perspective on this one? I want to piggyback on that, right? And I'm going to add, you know, that especially I'm very intrigued by, you know, technology today, you know, that allows patients to want to access all their health data, right? Um, and gives them ownership in managing it, right? So we are seeing the inception of those patient registries today that enable them not only uh, accessing their health data, but also all the clinical trials they're being part of, you know, and, and enable them to be part of communities pre and post trial engagement, right? And participate in educational efforts and advocate for for clinical trials, right? You know, so I think that's very powerful, and I, I'm looking forward to see the expansion of these technology applications. Yeah, I think the ownership piece is really key there. I mean, everybody likes to own their own data, um, so I, I couldn't agree more. Okay, uh, I think time for for one more question. Um, you mentioned the need to move to portfolio adoption of decentralized tech which is in theory, that's nice, but perhaps not realistic. Do you have any knowledge of anyone moving to a portfolio wide approach to any of these technologies? Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's a challenge, right? And it's still new in industry. We're still figuring it out. Uh, and the change management effort is huge, but we've seen it done before. And we've had all kinds of technologies that, it, that have gone enterprise. It, it takes time, it takes patience, it takes, um, some wins and losses and resistance and clear ROI and executive alignment, um, but it can be realistic. I, I mean, I go back to, it's sort of the how it's done. Um, have we seen it yet from a, a Viva perspective? We're starting to see it. We had a press release that went out a few weeks ago. We had an early adopter in Leo Pharma who's adopting our full digital platform. So everything touching site, patient and clinical operations, which is super exciting. Um, and based on the data, that we went through today and, and the way that the environment is moving, my guess, my educated guess is that CROs are gonna take the first leap um, towards standardizing at an enterprise level. They're gonna have to, right? The scale of work and, and um, the need for consistency and quality and all of their deliverables is gonna drive that. But I do think, you know, at the core, if we're really going to deliver optionality to patients and we're gonna make that journey variable for them, then we have to have consistency for us. Otherwise it's not gonna work. It's gonna to become too complicated. Um, so I do think enterprise standardization is gonna be the only way to be effective if we wanna add that level of, of optionality on top of it for the patient. Oriel, what, what do you think about this one? I completely agree, right? I mean, in our side, right? Not on the patient side, if we build too much optionality, we facilitate a terrible behavior, right? You often hear, you know, I used to hear when I was pushing innovations, well, this is very exciting, but not in my trial, right? And we see this quite often, right? Because in the industry, we have a diverse set of risk profiles, you know, in study teams. And they, 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 some people are willing to, to see it happening, but I'll jump the wagon on, you know, once I've seen a few rides, right? So, you know, we have to be careful. At the same time, we cannot force the hand, right? So it's about ensuring value creation for everybody. It's crystal clear to, to them, to all stakeholders in alignment with those jobs and outcomes they have to achieve, right? The buy-in is critical and building the right location and communicated channels at all levels, top down and, and up, you know, <laughs> You know, uh, you know, and down up, you know, it, it's critical, right? Because um, this will ensure that we ramp up it, you know, the, the implementation adoption, you know, of all these innovations and, and technologies at the same pace, you know, and we leave nobody behind. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. Um, okay, so I realize we are at time. Again, for any questions we didn't get to, of course, we will be reaching out. Um, or if you have any questions and want to follow up with us directly, feel free. In the meantime, uh, the recording will be sent out as well. And of course, you're welcome to access the survey and see, as I mentioned, all of the data points that sit behind the conversation we had today. Oriel, I want to thank you again for being my partner in today's conversation. And audience, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. We hope everybody has a wonderful afternoon and evening. Thanks to you, Bruna. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>